Well, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Jacob Borgeli, and I've been asked to give some lectures on the geometry of scattering amplitudes. And in particular, I wanted to talk about the uh, geometry of on-shell functions, which are in very important building blocks. So this series of lectures will um, contain a lot of material. The first lecture will be mostly about the big picture and the philosophy and some of the general consequences of um, uh, scattering in four dimensions among massless particles. In the second lecture, we'll talk about the um, combinatorics, in particular the Grassmannian, well, and uh, Avanchel diagrams, especially in the planar limit. And in the third lecture, we'll talk about that beyond the planar limit and the more general story for four-dimensional uh, quantum field theories involving massless particles. In the fourth lecture, we'll do something a little different, and we will talk um, about implementing things in Mathematica. I think it's a, uh, a good exercise to try to um, program, and the idea would be to, to do a live coding session for you. Um, and I apologize in advance if these lectures run a little long, and also if the um, homework is a little daunting. I hope that um, it, you should view it as inspiration for a class of problems that I think are very important for you to be able to solve. Um, and there are, there are homework uh, problems associated with each of the lectures. So we have a lot to, of ground to cover. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so this lecture is the vernacular of the S matrix. Basically the general big picture about um, scattering amplitudes and some of the new developments and some of the, the magic behind the new developments um, in our understanding of scattering amplitudes. You've heard some of these things discussed by other lecturers, I'm sure, um, but I just wanted to give you a big picture of the whole story. And in particular, um, the one of the key players in this advance, in these enormous advances in our understanding of on shells of scattering amplitudes are uh, classes of funny looking pictures like this, where the star players, um, the amplitohedron over here, and these things, and these funny looking pictures. And the, the star players in all of this are on shell functions, um, which are where the blobs in these pictures represent full S matrices, tree level S matrices. And the internal lines are not Feynman diagrams, are not Feynman propagators, but Feynman propagators on shell. And part of the point of this lecture is to discuss what this means in four dimensions and um, to give you an idea of why these are a useful starting point for re for re-describing quantum field theory and the basic principles that underlie it. So one of the key correspondences, and this slide is just to set the stage for the whole, for the first three um, lectures, more or less, which is that these star players, these on-shell diagrams are just funny pictures that are like Feynman diagrams. They are just built out of on-shell S matrices. We'll define them in a moment. But very importantly, there exists a correspondence for any quantum field theory in four dimensions of massless particles um, between these particular functions, which encode all of perturbation theory, and a particular volume integral over the Grassmannian of some planes and n dimensions. And this is a funny thing, but it turns out to be a very powerful correspondence. And to give you an idea of what this co correspondence looks like, um, the, the key aspects of this duality or this correspondence, um, on the physics side, we have these diagrams that are very important for understanding scattering amplitudes, especially perturbatively. And every one of these diagrams in any quantum field theory in four dimensions is associated with some subspace in some Grassmannian manifold. I'll define all of these quantities in a little bit. Don't worry right now. This is really just to give you the big picture. We'll describe all of this in detail over the next three lectures. So there's some subspace called C um, inside a funny space called the Grassmannian. And it has a particular volume form that depends on the theory. Volume preserving diffeomorphisms on the right hand side leave the functions invariant and these represent physical symmetries. Um, active transformations of the kinematics and the um, uh, helicities, for example, that leave these functions invariant. This is, for example, how the, well, not the Grassmannian, but 
this is how we can understand the Yangian symmetry of n equals four, a planar n equals four, for example, as volume preserving diffeomorphisms here. There are trivial sim symmetries like identities, but also homological ones, um, um, identities among functions that you can understand as geometric pictures. And this is, uh, a, a plays a starring role in um, what I'm gonna tell you about. Um, for example, we can draw this kind of diagram. And for theories that are very nice, like planar theories with maximum supersymmetry, the diagrams are very simple. They are planar, they have two colored vertices, and there's no decorations on any of the edges. So they're undirected graphs and they lie on a plane. And in this case, these strata have a very special name. They're called positroids. And the volume form couldn't possibly be simpler. It's just the wedge product of a bunch of d logs, these d log factors here. Um, this is true also, and the whole thing turns out to be um, just uh, uh, encoded combinatorially, which we'll talk about, in, especially in the second lecture. But for planar theories without maximum supersymmetry, the only thing that changes is that the graphs have to have edges, have to have orientations now. So they are now directed graphs. They're still planar. The volume form changes in a very subtle way, but for the most part, everything else stays the same. You still would expect volume preserving diffeomorphism. Oh, they are. Volume preserving diffeomorphisms are still symmetries of the theory. Um, and you'd expect that to be infinite dimensional just because diffeomorphisms usually are, um, diff are infinite dimensional. Um, for non-planar theories, but with maximum supersymmetry, almost everything goes through the same way. But but the uh, they're no longer called uh, positroid varieties, but rather called cluster varieties. Um, and we can talk about this for really any theory if we're willing to document and 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 uh, decorate these edges by you know what particles are transmitted between them and these internal edges. We can immediately get describe on shell functions for the standard model. Um, for non-supersymmetric theories, et cetera, et cetera. But outside of the case of planar maximum supersymmetry, we don't really understand the answers to any of these questions, although they are very important questions. <clears throat> for example, it turns out that we can show, and we'll talk about this, the number of essentially distinct functions is finite for any multiplicity, which is very interesting. Um, but how many are there? Nobody knows, at least not in general outside of the case of planar maximum supersymmetry. What are these functional relations? We call it the Yangian for planar n equals four for maximum supersymmetry. But what about the standard model? What about what are these infinite dimensional symmetries? And are they symmetries of amplitudes? All these are open questions. Um, and um, do we understand how to encode Feynman recursion or, or a perturbative quantum field theory directly in terms of these graphs? We'll see what that means in this lecture here. Okay, so this lecture's outline, it's kind of dense already. We're going to start with just kind of uh, setting the stage and talking about this new class of, very, of observables or physical data called on-shell functions. And we'll motivate that and talk about them. And especially the magic that happens in four dimensions um, when you have massless particles. We'll quickly see how to apply these to um, scattering amplitudes at tree level and at loop level. And then we'll talk about some consequences that you can immediately deduce from just the specialness of massless theories in four dimensions, in particular Weinberg's theorem, the uniqueness of Yang-Mills, et cetera, which will be part of your homework. Okay, so I wanna set the stage with a classic problem that I think um, anybody introducing scattering amplitudes at, especially at a PhD school has to, um, the story that everybody has to start with, which is to consider a scattering amplitude in particular, a tree level scattering amplitude for two gluons to collide and create four. And for the, the experts, I will assume that they all have the same helicity right now. Before modern computers, this would have been intractable for a very simple reason. The number of Feynman diagrams is hundreds. Nobody would ever do this by, uh, by on pen and paper. It clearly exceeds the, um, what you would ask a student to do. And in fact, it's clearly even a research level problem um, 220 diagrams is not that hard now on a computer, but uh, before computers, um, people needed this. And in fact, um, to give you an idea of how difficult this was, there was a, um, a prospectus of the theoretical challenges to be faced by the, for the soon 
to be developed, I mean, the, 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 the colliders that were being discussed in the early 80s, some of the theoretical challenges that would be um, faced by um, the existence of, I mean, that would be needed by such a collider. And, and indeed, in this paper here, the authors pointed out that among the many theoretical challenges, though the cross sections for elementary two to four processes have not been calculated. And yet this happens millions of times a second at the LHC. But already in the 80s, they'd realized that this was too hard. They hadn't been calculated and their complexity is such that they might not be evaluated in the foreseeable future. And they asked their readers to seek reliable estimates. Um, well, there are very few ways of motivating people better than um, uh, saying that something is impossible. And sure enough, two physicists at Fermilab, very practically minded, um, uh, answered this challenge. And in 1985, they threw everything they had at this problem. They introduced supersymmetry in, with hindsight for no good reason. They used the world's best supercomputers. They used every trick that they had available. And as soon as they got the answer, they rushed it to publication. Um, and with a beautiful one sentence abstract, the cross section for two gluon to four gluon scattering is given in a form suitable for fast numerical calculations. All right. And the final formula, they were able to compress it and simplify it down to a mere eight pages. This is what it looks like. And I don't expect you to be able to read that. These are a bunch of matrices, these are a bunch of terms. This is just at leading order, by the way, obviously. Um, I mean, it's after all, it's just a sum of Feynman diagrams at tree level, not that hard. The reason why I love this paper and why I usually I like to mention it in talks like this is because of this quixotic optimism that they chose to end the paper on. So after apologizing for not giving any details of, of their calculations, after all, they're just some Feynman diagrams, they said, furthermore, we hope to obtain a simple analytic form for the answer, making our result not only an experimentalist's, but also a theorist's delight. And, you know, I've asked them both about why they chose to end their paper this way. Um, and it's complicated. They had some experience and some intuition that perhaps those eight pages could be simplified. Well, within a few months, they guessed an answer that they could check numerically agreed with that eight page formula that must have exceeded their wildest dreams. Um, certainly a theorist delight. That process, two gluons to create four gluons, they found a one term expression for it. And again, they did not prove that this was the right answer. They just checked that it was right um, here. And what, what is much more shocking is that if you look at this and you can compare it to two to three and two to two, which they'd also known and also worked on, a very obvious pattern emerges. And you would guess that perhaps um, this formula should basically generalize to all multiplicity, to two gluons to create any number whatsoever at leading order of perturbation theory and all with the same helicity, um, this. And this all multiplicity guess was something of a, a I don't know, a, a, an outlier in the research. Nobody understood where this came from and it wouldn't be proven for decades. Um, we will prove it in this lecture. But it must have ex ex exceeded their wildest dreams. And I think that this amplitude, this, Park, this is the famous Park-Taylor amplitude, guessed by Park and Taylor, um, should be viewed as an indictment on our understanding of quantum field theory. Because when, you can imagine when, you, when two gluons create 50 gluons, the number of Feynman diagrams at leading order at tree level exceeds the number of atoms in the universe. That's not even counting the number of terms you might get, um, you know, considering the Feynman rules for gauge theory. This is astounding that 10 to the 84 Feynman diagrams would all add up and cancel out into something this simple, I think should be viewed as a sign that the Feynman expansion really is missing something. And I think from today's, from our perspective today, what's, what's wrong or morally wrong with the Feynman expansion is the dependence on virtual particles and um, loca local space time, which forces us into, to use gauge redundancies and other kinds of things that that the experimentalists couldn't care less about. Um, and so it's natural to wonder if there was any way that you could just, is there a reformulation of quantum field theory for which when you ask the question that what is the amplitude for two gluons to create some number, that this is immediately the answer. And we will find that these on-shell diagrams, although they look a little weird, immediately allow us to derive this formula and gives us this answer directly, which is very beautiful.
and a big deal. But a natural question would be, what happens when all the gluons don't have the same helicity? Or um, by crossing symmetry, that's, that's equivalent to saying, what if you had three gluons in and, and any number coming out, et cetera? And it's natural that the, it's, it's, you might naturally guess a generalization of this formula. And we will see, especially in the next lecture, that that's morally pretty close to the right answer. We'll see that that is one way that we could have discovered this connection to Grassmannian geometry. But let's get going. And, and I think the first point, the first lesson to learn from this is to step back and to ask us ourselves, what should an amplitude depend on? And you know what, what are the class of functions that we should be talking about, even at tree level? So a scattering amplitude can be, it's some general function of all of the observable data that describes the particles involved. So we're gonna represent an amplitude by some gray blob like this, it has some number of particles involved. And the physical data for the eighth particle are a few obvious things, the momentum but, and the mass, but these are not all independent because there's Einstein's relation. Um, p squared is equal to m squared for on for because the experimentalists only see on shell states. So there are no virtual particles in an in a laboratory, at least not in your detectors. Um, and so you have um, p the momenta subject to this quadratic condition. Um, you also have the spin of the particle and the helicity, which can which we all know from quantum mechanics can range from minus the spin to plus the spin. And when mass, when the mass is zero, the helicity has to be in the direction of motion or against the direction of motion. So it collapses to a two state system. Um, we're going to be mostly interested in massless particles in these lectures here. And then there's a lot of other numbers, all the non kinematic quantum numbers that describe the states involved. Like, for example, there are eight gluons in the standard model. So which one? Um, and we can call that a color or flavor or whatever. It doesn't really matter. It's some label that labels the state. Um, so there are those things, but they're not dynamical. They're, they're not, they don't depend on the momenta. They're more like naming. Um, and in the Lagrangian, this is not the language that we talk about in a quantum field theory book, in part because of the prominence of virtual particles. Um, and that requires a lot more um, uh, baggage in particular, um, having a local Lagrangian description forces us to talk about redundancies in our field descriptions. This is why A mu has four components, but only two degrees of freedom. Um, and this, this requirement that we talk about degrees of freedom that no experimentalist will ever see is I think what we now view as the, un, the is responsible for the um, incredible complexity in the Feynman expansion is that not only is every single Feynman diagram a fantasy, we all know that we're not allowed to think of a Feynman diagram as a picture of what happened in space-time because that's not a meaningful question in quantum mechanics. We have to add up all of the diagrams before we can get a, um, a physically meaningful prediction. Um, and so you can't say which Feynman diagram was the actual history, otherwise they wouldn't interfere. Um, so we know that individual Feynman diagrams are a fantasy to begin with, but it's worse than that. And it's because in a gauge theory, at least, there are more degrees of freedom in every Feynman diagram than there are physical states. Um, and this requirement to carry around this unobservable, unphysical baggage, theoretical baggage for sure, um, is almost certainly responsible for the incredible obfuscation of the simplicity that we find in the answers that we get from quantum field theory. So to, for, to rid ourselves from this kind of redundancy, it's natural to kind of step back and say, what are the classes of things that we're allowed to talk about if we're not allowed to talk about uh, virtual particles or ghosts or any of the other unphysical baggage that's part of the standard treatment of quantum field theory? And it turns out that we can talk about a very large uh, class of, of observables. First, we can talk about an S matrix. This class of observables that I'm going to talk about are called on-shell functions because they only in, they only depend on uh, on-shell states, you know, non-virtual states. Um, and the S matrix is clearly an on-shell function. It clearly only depends on observable quantities. But if you know any S matrices whatsoever, you can start gluing them together in a more complicated and interesting way. In particular, you can take two and glue them into something that we call a factorization channel. Um, and the meaning of this picture um, is entirely dictated by quantum mechanics, basic principles of quantum mechanics. Um, 
in any quantum theory that is local and unitary. And in particular, quantum mechanics tells us that if the theory is local, then the process over, then this internal particle is a real observable state and not real necessarily, but, but is an observable state in the, in the theory. And therefore this can travel arbitrary distances in space and time. And so this left process and the right process have to be entirely independent. And the independency of those in a local quantum field theory means that we should multiply this. The meaning of this should be the, multi the product of the two. And unitarity dictates that we marginalize over the unobserved states. And so we have to introduce a complete set of states. And summing over all of the degrees of freedom inside this for this internal particle means integrating over its on-shell phase space. It's Lorentz invariant on-shell phase space. That's, this is this delips. So it's all the momenta subject to the condition that P squared equals M squared. And then we have to sum over all of the other labels that could be there, which gluon we're talking about, um, you know, uh, it's spin, et cetera. So all of the other um, things that we need to introduce a complete set of states um, in between this. Um, and I'm being very general right now. I'm saying that this is, in, this is a D minus one dimensional integral in part because I wanna make it very clear that this picture and the meaning of this picture is completely well-defined in any quantum field theory in any number of dimensions, um, at least as long as the theory is local and unitary. Um, and so, and in, fact, and in fact, we don't, we can talk about things that are not just products of two things, but we can talk about entire graphs. And in particular, um, we're gonna say that an on-shell function is a network of amplitudes, usually tree level amplitudes, connected by internal particles, which are on shell, forming some sort of diagram. And the definitions that we just saw are naturally generalized. It's you, the product of all of the amplitudes at every vertex integrating over the on-shell phase space of every internal line. One of the natural conditions or thing that's that's useful to always keep in the back of your mind when you look at one of these kinds of pictures is the number of constraints. For example, in this case, if you were to look at a process like this, there is actually a condition imposed on the momenta of this graph. In particular, it says that the sum of the momenta here squared is equal to the mass squared of that internal particle, which may or may not be zero, but that's a constraint. So generic momenta will not satisfy that constraint. So this would be a distribution on the space of kinematics. Um, in general, the number of delta functions is a useful metric and it's very easy to count. It's just, there's momentum conservation at every single vertex. So D times the number of vertices. Um, <coughs> however, that's kind of um, a little too much or it's a little excessive in part because the um, any graph of momentum conserving amplitudes will conserve momenta across the entire graph. And so there's always a net, oh, sorry, the number, sorry, that's the number of total number of delta functions. Um, and then we have ni for each internal edge, we have d minus one integrals to do. So that's the number of delta functions we have. But again, this, uh, it always in, encodes momentum conservation across the entire graph. And so it's natural to say the net number of delta functions after you've imposed momentum conservation which is subtract D. So one of these vertices, ignore that. Um, and this is the number of net delta functions in these graphs. So if you look at D N delta hat for this graph, you find that there's two momentum conserving delta functions there. So there's eight delta functions, there's three integrals to do. So we have five delta functions left over, four of those are momentum conservation. So there's net one uh, constraint. It's the number of excess delta functions on generic momentum conserving momenta. It's minus the number of remaining integrations that you have to do. Um, and when this is equal to zero, we just get a rational function of the kinematics, or it's maybe not rational, but it's an algebraic function. It's a product of everything. And we get isolated solutions to these constraints. But if it's greater than zero, we have some number of constraints like this case, it's a factorization channel. It's a singularity of an amplitude. And when it's negative, we have some number of non-trivial integrations to do. Um, so we have to specify the contour of integration on anything that remains. Um, anyway, the point is, is that these graphs are well-defined in any quantum field theory. And we can use them to build up a very um, broad category of on-shell diagrams and functions. And it's been known since the early 90s or even earlier, perhaps, that this vocabulary of, of functions, 
this large list of data um, can be used to reproduce and per perturbation theory in any quantum field theory, perhaps with regularizations, so with some caveats, um, but that this encodes complete information about any perturbative amplitude in any quantum field theory. But to make anything more concrete, we need to have some amplitudes at our fingertips. And so far, you'll notice that I haven't told you any amplitudes yet, and so you can't really play this game to start building them up. And this is why something very special happened. This is what's special about massless theories in four dimensions. And to show you why we need to talk about kinematics in four dimensions. So that's from now on, we're gonna focus our attention on four dimensions and for math and theories of massless particles. And the first point is that we don't really wanna talk about four momenta um, in particular, because there's that quadratic constraint that says that it's on shell. So P squared equals zero is kind of an annoying thing to carry around. And there's an easy way of trivializing um, the on-shell condition for a massless particle, and that's called spinner helicity variables, which goes back a long way. So the first step is to, is to upgrade or transform any four momenta into a two by two matrix um, by dotting it into the Pauli matrices. And one of the things that you'll notice is that the determinant of this matrix is just the norm squared of the momentum, which is equal to m squared for a generic momentum. And for a massless particle, it's zero. And that means that this two by two matrix um, representing the four momenta, this is obviously lossless information, um, uh, just tells you that this matrix cannot be full rank. It has to have it uh, at most rank one. And the easiest way of making that fact manifest that it's a, it's a lower rank matrix is to write it as the outer, outer product of a pair of two vectors called spinners. A uh, lambda and a lambda tilde. The outer product um, of, of a pair of vectors will have rank one in, in general. A couple things to note about this trans about this change. The first, um, so first I want to I should clarify that for generic lambdas and lambda tildes, p squared will equal zero. So this immediately encodes on shell momenta in a very natural way. When p is real. Um, notice that this matrix is Hermitian. That's useful to bear in mind. And it's certainly a constraint that you'd like to impose on the external kinematics, but not maybe not necessarily on the internal ones, um, which implies that lambda and lambda tilde are complex conjugates of each other. So you can count complex degrees of freedom for three, R31, or, but it turns out to be very useful to kind of be sloppy about this and only impose this on the external kinematics that the experimentalists care about at the end. Um, but so, which is another way of saying that for the most part, we're gonna talk about complex momenta where lambda and lambda tilde are just generic two vectors in uh, two, comp two vectors of complex numbers. Um, notice that P is unchanged by scaling lambda by anything and lambda tilde by its inverse. This is the action of the little group. Um, the, the, all the Lorentz transformations that leave the momentum invariant and this is a very useful redundancy. So that's why you don't have, um, that's where the extra degree of freedom comes from, right? P, you have four degrees of freedom here subject to one constraint. It looks like I have two times two degrees of freedom here. Well, there's a redundancy, this rescaling here. Um, and so and if, thinking about how external states scale on, under the action of the little group tells you that on shell functions need to scale in a very specific way under, um, under little group transformations. And so the scaling under lambda and lambda tilde um, turns out to be very informative um, uh, and related to the helicities of the states involved. The another thing that the spinners do very well is they make the action of the Lorentz group very obvious, um, even easier than P squared. The local Lorentz group is SL2 left and SL2 right, and it just acts in the fundamental representation on the two respectively. And that means that Lorentz invariants have to be constructed out of determinants. So that this is something that's invariant under SL2, special linear transformations of lambdas and special linear transformations of lambda tildes. Um, there's a, we use a symbolic way of representing these things. And we say that angle bracket AB means det lambda A lambda B and square bracket means det of the lambda tildes. So we can talk about this um, lambda lambda tilde as something like an angle square bracket thing. This is useful when we talk about formulas. Um, if you really like indices and epsilons, that's what the formula is. Um, there. 
So I, I want to actually take a side note and point out that um, that the kinematics data is actually the, our first example of something that, um, or at least a, it's a nice way for me to introduce a concept that'll be very important in these lectures, which is Grassmannians. So let me explain what I mean by this. The first point is that if we think about a scattering process involving n, ex, n massless states in four dimensions, the data that describes that process is a pair of two by n matrices, all of the components of lambdas for each of the particles and all the components um, of the lambda tildes. And we talk about the whole matrix as uh, without indices, lambda and lambda tilde. Um, and we can think about it as row, as column, as row vectors. The upper lambda upper one means this whole n vector um, of the first row and the n vector of the second row. But we can also think about it as columns, as a pair, uh, as n column vectors, which is probably the more natural way of thinking about it, obviously. Um, and so we can think when I write lambda sub a, I mean a particular a labels the state, and I'm talking about a particular two vector column. And when I put an upper index, I mean the whole row vector here. Because Lorentz transformations act mix up the rows of each matrix, the Lorentz invariant and little group um, allows us to rescale things. The invariant content of say the lambdas is not this two by n matrix, but at least the Lorentz invariant content is this two by n matrix modulo little group, um, which is rescaling and modulo SL2, which means modulo GL2. So it's not just this whole two by n matrix, it's this two by n matrix modulo um, all possible linear transformations of these two rows. And there's a, this is a very special name. It's called the Grassmannian the, uh, of two planes and n dimensions. And the idea is to think about it in terms of these rows, which is not the way we normally think about this data. So we have these two row vectors, lambda one and lambda two, and they're just lines in CN, okay? And Lorentz transformations allow us to mix, to rotate these into each other and also to rescale them, which means that the Lorentz invariant content at least is the plane. It's not these two rows, but it's the span of these two rows. Um, and the span of two vectors in, in n dimensions is called the Grassmannian of two planes in n dimensions, two planes for the origin to be clear. Um, and this generalizes in a natural way. So the Grassmannian GKN is the span of K vectors in n dimensions. You can think about it as K by n matrices, modulo general linear transformations, modulo GLK, um, or you can think about it as just um, you know, and the span of these things. This is a very simple thing. This is the natural generalization of projective space, which is um, the span of uh, n vectors in one dimension. So it's a one by n matrix modulo GL1, which is just rescaling. So P1 or, or Pn is just G1n. So it's a space that you might already be quite familiar with. One of the reasons for talking about to using momenta and the spinners to talk about um, um, the Grassmannian is to illustrate one important, uh, to, to illustrate um, an, in, an interesting interpretation of momentum conservation. So momentum conservation, taking all the particles to be incoming as we always do, is this four constraints that every single component of the P's adds up to zero, okay, obviously. In terms of the two by two matrices, that means it's a two by two matrix of constraints where you sum over all the particles and you get PA that. And in terms of the spinners, it means this. Now, I wanna introduce a shorthand for summing over the particle index. So as matrices, this little center dot means dot transpose as a matrix operation. So I just don't wanna write a transpose on every single equation. So I'm gonna write a dot in the middle to mean dot transpose. Okay, and so momentum conservation becomes this constraint that you have a you have a, a, a two plane lambda and a two plane lambda tilde in n dimensions, and they have to be orthogonal to each other. And orthogonality by this, I, what I really mean is that lambda has to be inside the complement, the space that is not spanned by lambda tilde, and vice versa. Um, and this duality between a, obviously any a two plane in n dimensions, there's a natural dual, which is the n minus two plane in n dimensions. It's the space that is not spanned by lambda. It's the complementary space. 
And this is a duality between configurations in the Grassmannian that are that is in two different Grassmannians that is very useful. Um, and in general, it's just something nice to think about, but it has one very critical. Um, so this is what it means geometrically is that the orthogonal complement of, of lambda lambda has to contain lambda tilde, has to span lambda tilde as a two plane. And this is, has one consequence that is very useful, which is in the case of three dimensions. So one case where there's something very powerful about this, and I want to derive that now, which is to show you that um, momentum conservation and this on-shell condition uniquely fixes the, um, the analytic form to all orders of perturbation theory for the, for the three particle amplitude involving any states up to some label dependent um, prefactors, some coupling constants. And the idea is very simple. So we start off with some function of lambdas and lambda tildes. This is the helicities of the three states. Um, but we look at this momentum conservation and we see that we have a two plane in three dimensions and a two plane in three dimensions. And it is not possible for uh, a pair of two planes to be orthogonal in three dimensions. So in particular, um, if we look at the orthogonal complement of this, it's a one plane in three dimensions. It's a row. It's we can so something we can visualize. We have a three-dimensional plane, and we have one um, uh, a plane, a two plane in three dimensions, and we have a unique vector orthogonal to it through the origin. And this is the orthogonal complement. And the total rank is three, so you can't have a pair of distinct two planes. Um, and so momentum conservation tells you that either lambda tilde has to be singular, either it can't be a full two plane, it has to be spanned by this one vector or vice versa. And so momentum conservation for three particles splits into these two distinct conditions, either um, lambda lambda's generic or lambda tilde is generic. And in particular, that means that the, whatever the amplitude it is, it can only depend on the lambdas or the lambda tildes and not both. And working on the little, looking at the little group scaling actually unique, uniquely fixes the functional form. In this case, there's the only Lorentz invariants you can write down are these brackets and the scaling uniquely determines the exponents. This is a very familiar um, formula if you know conformal field theory for very different reasons, but it's the same kind of argument um, that appears there. And so you really have these two distinct cases to consider. Um, and in general, you don't have to consider both of them. And the reason is because if you think about what happens, you know, some, of, some of you I hope are already thinking, um, but I thought, you, I thought that I told you, or I thought that you might be thinking to yourself that uh, didn't you say that lambdas and lambda tildes have to be complex conjugates of each other for real momenta? And yes, that's, that's absolutely true. And so for real momenta, this is not possible. Um, and that means that the S matrix for three particles involving real momenta, meaning an R31 is zero to all orders of perturbation theory. This is a very classic result that people know very well. What I'm saying here is that the analytic continuation is unique and which one you care about is determined by the helicities. And you can see that by going to the limit of real momenta. So um, in particular, if all of the brackets are all small because you're in momentum conserving for real momenta, you see that it goes to this negative sum of the helicities. And this goes to epsilon to the positive sum. And that means that if you want to have it smooth and not have it pull for real momenta, this is the only answer that you can take for the, when the sum of helicities is negative. And this is the only answer that you can take when the sum of helicities is positive. When the sum of helicities is equal to zero, it's either trivial it, or it doesn't matter. Um, so um, I'll leave you to think about that um, when it's equal to zero. But for most theories that we care about, it's not that it doesn't equal zero and you have two different conditions. So the helicities completely dictate this function. And nothing I said would allow, um, and it should be clear that this cannot get renormalized or anything else um, um, because there cannot be any, there are no little group neutral factors to write down inside a logarithm or anything else. So this is a very different picture than, um, than ordinary quantum field theory. And the reason is because this is not a correlation function, this is the S matrix. It unique, it, it, and this is the unique non-perturbable analytic continuation of the S matrix for three particles. Um, and the fact that it requires complex momenta doesn't actually bother us very much as we'll see because the 
when you start gluing these pictures together, the internal ones can be complex, it doesn't matter. The external particles are the only things the experimentalists care about. So we have these two conditions. And in many theories, like Yang-Mills theory, you have a single state and it's CP conjugate, like plus and minus helicity gluons. And if you were to take this and you were to say this was plus one, minus one, minus one, um, you could put in the H's and you'd find that it's this. Oh, it's, that should be kind of familiar as the Park-Taylor amplitude for, but for three particles. And similarly for this here. And if in a theory where you only have a single state and it's CP conjugate, like Yang-Mills or supersymmetric Yang-Mills in general, we don't need to draw the, it, we can encode the solicity flow with arrows by saying that two in and one out is a blue vertex and one in and two out is a white vertex. And um, the uh, exclusion of source, pure sources and pure sinks, this gives you networks of three particle vertices, which is a very interesting set of problems in graph theory to begin with. So we could say that this is the three particle S matrix in Yang Mills, same and one of these. And something really nice, but you could talk about this with fermions and, and uh, uh, photons as well. So this would be it in QED and massless QED. Um, and in supersymmetric theories, I wish I had more time to talk about this notation. Um, all of the helicity states are all unified into one supermultiplet. And you, have, you don't need to talk about the decorations because supersymmetry relates a particle and its CP conjugate. Um, and so you only have a unique vertex of this type and one of this type. And this super function encodes all of the particular amplitudes in the theory. Um, I wish I had more time to talk about that notation because it is kind of useful. But for the most part, for these lectures, those of you who are less familiar with supersymmetry, you can just kind of ignore this thing in the numerator. This is just something that allows you to do bookkeeping and to keep track of which particular amplitudes you care about. Okay. So given these two little fundamental building blocks, you can start gluing them together in interesting ways. And you can construct pictures, these functions, on-shell functions, that are well-defined to all orders of perturbation theory. Like this picture here, it looks like a loop, but if you compute, but it's a rational function um, and it's just a function of four particles. And you can glue more and more edges into the graph and every one of these pictures is uniquely well-defined to all orders of perturbation theory. You can talk about them in non-planar theories. You can talk about them in theories with multiple kinds of particles. This starts looking way too much like a Feynman diagram for my own taste. But the point is, is that these are pictures that are well-defined in any theory of massless particles like the standard model. Um, and it's this vocabulary of objects that is forming the basis of these lectures that I'd like to, to, to focus on. And, and in particular, how to calculate them, how to use them, and how to understand um, their properties better. Okay. So diagrams that are built out of these little three particle vertices in general, I'm gonna call primitive. And primitive on-shell diagrams play a very special role. And in general, I hope, I mean, you don't know how to do it efficiently yet. I've given you everything you need to know to go home and compute what this on-shell function is. I'm not gonna give that as homework. We're gonna see it. Um, in the third lecture, we'll understand how to compute this much more efficiently. Um, but the point is, is that you just multiply every single vertex all uh, together, and then you integrate over the on-shell phase space over every internal line. And it turns out that the number of delta functions is equal to the number of uh, integrations to do. And so this is just some rational function. And we'll, as we'll see in the third lecture, it's just equal to something like that. Um, and this has nothing to do immediately with an amplitude. It's a cut of an amplitude, maybe. We'll talk about, uh, we won't really talk about that very much. But I just want to point out, I just want to make it clear that this, these are objects of intrinsic interest. And being able to compute them and understand them is the goal of these lectures, uh, of this series of lectures. So there's one tool which is very useful for us to understand, which is how to build up a, build up a diagram starting from something simpler. And that is to take a general on-shell function. This is not an amplitude anymore. This is just some graph maybe primitive, maybe not, it doesn't matter. It's just built out of vertices. And it's some on-shell function and I'm going to create a new on-shell function F by attaching this pair of vertices. Adding this pair of vertices increases the number of internal lines by three. There's one there, there's one there, and there's one there. And I've added two delta functions. That means I've added nine integrations, three times three, and I've added eight delta functions. 
oh, so I have one new integral to do. There's one in fixed degree of freedom there. And adding this B BCFW bridge can be viewed as just taking this object and somehow can, um, shifting the momentum flowing through A and B by the amount of momentum flowing through that internal line. So it's pretty easy to work out how, um, how momentum conservation works. You start off with this and then you impose momentum conservation in that vertex and in that vertex. And the single degree of freedom that's left over we can call alpha. And <clears throat> it's pretty clear that this new function has to have a pole when alpha equals zero that gives you back to the original function, a residue at alpha equals zero. And in the, for maximally supersymmetric theories, or actually just for n equals four, adding this bridge just adds a d alpha over alpha to the function, which now depends on a hat and b hat now depend on alpha. So it deforms the amplitude in a simple way. And to get back to the original function, you just take the residue on alpha equals zero. Okay, now this is just kind of a cute thing and it actually allows you to build up a huge vocabulary of even non-planar on-shell functions. Um, but the most important application of this has to be recursion relations. So the idea of this is very simple. We can start with, um, say, suppose that I had the diagram for an amplitude, or maybe a sum of diagrams for the amplitude, who knows right now. It's, it's an, this whole thing is some on-shell diagram. It doesn't need to be primitive, and it doesn't need to be a single diagram. But I'm going to take this amplitude, this on-shell function, and I'm going to attach a BCFW bridge to it. Um, alpha. Now this thing depends on alpha, and I clearly don't care about how it depends on alpha, or not very much. So the undeformed amplitude is recovered as the residue about alpha equals zero. So we can get back to the left-hand side, the original thing we wanted, by just taking the residue about the origin in this alpha space. But this is where, but we get some juice out of Cauchy's theorem, which is that the residue at the origin, if we think about this little residue encircling this pole, is equal to minus the sum of the residues away from the origin. Um, and this becomes very powerful when we realize that we already know all of the poles of an amplitude. Where are the alpha not equal zero places that this object has a pole? And if we think about the sum of Feynman diagrams, those poles correspond to when a Feynman propagator goes on shell. And those can happen in two different ways. In general, they're um, either, all Feynman propagators uh, of every any Feynman diagram can be divided into two categories. Either when you cut the diagram, it breaks the diagram into two, that's called a factorization channel, or you cut the diagram and it lowers the loop order. So those are called forward limits. And if you collect together all the diagrams with this and all the diagrams with lower loop but two extra particles that are glued together, this is just a classification of Feynman propagators, um, edges of, of a general graph. Um, the only distinction here is that this um, is that alpha is not equal to zero here. And that means that the on-shell diagrams we get are these more interesting things. And indeed, this reproduces the sum of Feynman diagrams in n equals four. I haven't added arrows yet, and I haven't talked about poles at infinity. If I, if I knew one, things about poles at infinity and I knew how to draw arrows, I would be able to talk about more general quantum field theories. But the point is, is that we get this kind of recursive picture for um, the amplitude or the, at least the sum of Feynman diagrams, which something sometimes called the integrand um, in terms of these pictures. And we'll, I, I hope in the next few minutes to give you some intuition for how uh, these pictures look and work. So one thing that's kind of important is to characterize these graphs by how many, by the, how many blue vertices or something. This we can, um, introduce an extra label on a, a diagram, which is the number of minus helicity gluons flowing in through the graph. So if we were to draw arrows on the graph, how many in coming are there? Um, and this characteristic M is interesting because it can be, you can group, do this recursion separately for each M. And we're gonna see that this is, we need to understand this stratification of these um, recursion relations to understand um, the park taylor amplitude, for example. In terms of a, on a primitive graph, it's twice the number, it's two edges per blue vertex, one per white vertex, and minus one for every internal edge. So it's something very easy to define in terms of the graph. And for the, the bridge terms, it's pretty easy to work out that the, the number of minuses on the left and the number of minuses on the right add up, um, exceed the number of, for the whole graph by one, because you have this new internal edge here. Adding a bridge does not change M 
I'll leave that as an exercise, very easy exercise for you to convince yourself of. Okay, so the Park-Taylor amplitude, remember, is just the case of m equals two. It's have two particles in. And I wanna now convince you that this recursion relation immediately gives us the Park-Taylor formula. And I wanna do that with including the subtleties. Um, so we start by applying this recursion relation to the case of, of two particles in and two particles out. So the m equals two four particle amplitude. And we just follow our nose. So the first point is that the left and right have to add up to m equals three. And because you have, and they have to be three particle vertices. So there are two diagrams. Notice that the bottom part of this graph has to be the same. And that's because in the recursion relations, you got to pick which legs you, you wanted to use to do the shift. Those are fixed once and for all. And everything in this on the right-hand side has to have those two legs as chosen um, um, as special legs. It doesn't matter what legs you pick, but you have to pick two. And so if we pick legs one and four, we get these two diagrams. Now, there's an important little subtlety about this um, that I need to emphasize, which is that this diagram is zero, um, or at least it's zero for generic momenta. And the reason is because if you think about momentum conservation across this diagram, um, uh, this vertex here says that all the lambdas at this edge, this edge, and this edge all are proportional to each other. And this white vertex says that the lambdas of particle one, that internal edge, and that internal edge are all proportional to each other. Net telling you that the lambdas of particle one and lambda of particle two have to be proportional to each other, or that the angle bracket of one and two has to be zero. Similarly for the blue vertices here. And so a chain of same colored vertices connecting two external edges immediately tells you that there's an additional constraint imposed on the kinematics. And so this term, you might or may or may not choose to include it someday as a singularity of an amplitude, but it is very different from this, which this is a generic, this is a function which is generic and non-zero for momentum conserving momenta. This one imposes some extra constraints on the spinners of the particles involved. So we're gonna throw this out as this is because it's a distribution and we have one term that survives. But of course, as I told you, you get to pick which legs you want. Instead of choosing one and four, I could have chosen one and two and you get this picture. And it is not the sum of these two pictures. This is the answer or this is the answer. They're both the answer. And this is our first instance of, uh, of, of that these recursion relations really don't give you unique pictures um, because it depends on which legs you picked to do the recursion. So this is the right answer or that's the right answer They're the same right answer. It doesn't matter. Um, and that kind of redundancy we're gonna see is, uh, becomes a little bit harsher as we go on. But the point is, is that when we look at this, the only non-vanishing contribution we can have that adds up to M equals three across the two things being bridged is to have the MHV, the, this is called the MHV amplitude, but the, the M equals two amplitude on the left bridged with the uh, uh, M equals one three particle amplitude on the right. Um, and that means that for five particles, this is our only non-vanishing term. And then we can put in this picture in there and it doesn't matter which one we choose, but if, we, but if we pick those two legs to do the recursion, we'll get a picture like that. And for six particles, we get that picture. Now these pictures are pretty ugly and pretty scary looking, but the important thing is, is that, that I want you to emphasize is that, that I want you to appreciate is that this is one picture for this amplitude. And I'll show you how to compute this picture, but I've, I think I've already defined it for you. And when you compute this single picture, you get the Park-Taylor guess. Um, and this is true for any multiplicity whatsoever. So when you ask it how many, you know, the, for two incoming gluons and 50 outgoing gluons, all of the same helicity, this recursion gives you one term. And it might be a pretty ugly looking graph, but the point is, is that there's only one term in there. And, it's, and, and as we will see, that is the Park-Taylor um, formula. So, this, so the recursion relations, one upshot is that it immediately gives you the Park-Taylor formula. This is a framework that we were hoping for. Um, and moreover, it gives you actually extremely concise formulas for all other amplitudes that you could think of. For example, consider three to three. This is the M equals three amplitude for six particles. Well, throwing out the terms that vanish again, we see that we get three terms and we can recurse 
we know what these, this thing is and we get to pick any two legs we'd like and we can pick any two legs we'd like on every blob and we keep feeding in this recursion picture into itself. Remember, notice that by the way, every single term being bridged here is either an M equals two or in this case, M equals three, but it's for five particles and N to um, M to N minus M uh, is, a, is a symmetry. Well, it's not symmetry, but it's, um, those are the same argument. Um, and so everything here is a single unique little blow up or not a, the unique picture, but there's only one term. So we get three terms that survive. And this is the right answer. And it should impress you. It's three terms instead of 220 Feynman diagrams. And including the other picture that you had for the M equals two case, we have four pictures to calculate, to care about for all velocity amplitudes for involving six particles. So there are a couple observations that I wanna stress right now. Um, the first is that um, there's no pick right answer to the pictures that come out of recursion. And that is because at every single stage of the recursion, you get to pick whichever legs you want. And not only do the pictures change, but the formulas change too. When you convert these pic this picture into a formula and this picture into a formula and this picture into a formula, you have three weird looking functions. And none of those three are equal to any of these three. So you can get very different formulas, not only very different looking pictures, but very different formulas for an amplitude. So there is no, a, there is no BCFW formula for an amplitude. There's a whole category of different BCFW formulae. Um, uh, and there's no reason to prefer one scheme of recursion over another, at least not any good reason. And the other thing that you would notice if you calculated these things as Brit Okachazo and Fang originally did when they discovered these recursion relations is that actually this function, that function, and this function are all essentially identical. And by that, I mean that by they calculated them the hard way and they found that actually this diagra diagram with its labels twisted by two or rotated by two and this diagram with its labels rotated by two in the other way are all the exact same function. So in fact, this, amplitude, these three random, these three weird looking graphs is just whatever this function is, plus its rotation, plus its rotation. So the functions, it's actually extremely concise. And I, I, this should surprise you because if you look at this diagram and that diagram, these are not rotations of each other. So there's clearly a lot of redundancy in these diagrams and understanding that and getting rid of it is gonna be part of our second lecture. <clears throat> So we'd like to have a, is there, we, we'd like to ask, is there some more invariant way of characterizing the functions associated with these diagrams? And that's what we're gonna answer in the next lecture. Okay, um, just briefly, I wanna show you what loop level recursion looks like. Um, for the four particle two, M equals two, but at one loop, there's no terms because the three particle amplitudes are fixed to all orders of perturbation theory, you can't, have a, a factorization channel. So the only thing that you can get is the forward limit of an M equals three six particle amplitude. So you have three diagrams. And the instructions are to glue those two legs together everywhere and then add this bridge. So you have these three contributions to the four particle one loop amplitude integrand. And the first thing that you notice is that this diagram and this diagram are zero um, in general, so they're distributions. And so the whole answer is in fact, just this single term. And it's a funny looking diagram, but if you look at it, it's a diagram with n hat delta um, of minus four. That means that this is an on-shell diagram that which after you've imposed every single, um, uh, you've done every single phase space integral you can think of, you still have four integrations left. And that's a good, that's a good thing because this having four net integrations should be matching the loop integral. And indeed, there is a contour of integration. It's over real momenta. Um, and it's just over the on-shell phase space of this internal line that has three degrees of freedom and also this last degree of freedom here that's, that's unfixed. So in this four-dimensional integrand is in fact what you'd get from the loop amplitude. So it gives very concise things for recursion too. I'm not gonna have much more to say about loops, but I just wanna show that these diagrams do naturally encode loops. Okay, I want to finish this lecture with some homework that we're going to talk about. And, I'm, and, be, uh, and because it's part of your homework assignment, I'm going to more or less just quote some things that are very important to that. And that is, 
that just thinking about factorization, which is very intimately tied to locality and unitarity, the existence of factorization channels, very strongly limits um, the kinds of quantum field theories that you could care about um, that are consistent with locality and unitarity. And some of these theorems are very deep and hard to prove from a, uh, from a Lagrangian, from a traditional point of view, but they're very slick and, and quick from this point of view. And if you'd like any help on the homework, you should look at this paper here by Benincasa and Cachazo. But the basic idea is that you can imagine a spin S particle or spin sigma particle. Um, and consider this particular amplitude where you have one and two is incoming and three and four is outgoing. And I don't know anything about this function right now, but if it's a local theory that's unitary, I do know about its pole, its residue on um, uh, its factorization channels. And when you work out momentum conservation here in the on-shell condition, you know, so this tells you that this has a spinner, a lambda tilde that's fixed, and this one has a lambda that's fixed. The net effect is that you get a formula like this for the residue. Um, and it is uniquely fixed to all orders of perturbation theory, um, this, this factorization. Um, well, uh, yeah. <clears throat> now, the, so this little, this is a Wick contraction notation and just means sum over the quantum labels or quantum number labels of the internal particle. And when you work out what these things are, you find that this is just u to the sigma. So there's some pre-factor which, so, which has all the little group weight. And this tells you that the amplitude has a pole. If it has a pole, it, the form of that pole is uniquely fixed. It is one over u, the Mandelstam u, to some power that depends on the spin. And as I hope, as I hope to lead you through in the homework, um, and you can check the solutions for, the, for more details if you can't solve it, is that you can prove some really remarkable things just knowing how these factorizations work. In particular, you can learn that if sigma is greater than two, so if the spin of the particle is more than two, you can't have consistent factorizations. And that means that there are no long range theories of massless particles with spin greater than two. That's very interesting. You know, Some of you might tell me that the, uh, in the chart of the nuclides or in the periodic table, there are nuclides with very high spin. That's true, but they're also massive. Um, and being massive is kind of related to it not having a long range interaction. Um, so for massless particles in four dimensions, spin two is really the highest you get for at least local quantum field theories. This is called Weinberg's theorem. And I ask you to prove it um, in, um, um, uh, in your homework. A couple other things that I'd like to um, also ask you to prove, but I think I listed them as extra credit problems, is the first is that if you have spin one, that whatever these coupling constants are, these Fs, that the, the just numbers that depend on this, the labels of the particles, they have to satisfy a Jacobi identity. And that means that the spin one particles that interact with each other have to have labels that transform as the adjoint representation of some Lie algebra. That's great, that's gauge theory, that's Yang-Mills. So we learned that Yang-Mills is the unique theory of the massless particles of spin one that interact with each other um, and that are local and unitary. This is not at all obvious from a Lagrangian point of view. What, what prevented you from choosing the fundamental representation for gluons? Well, this is the answer, is that they have to form the adjoint representation of whatever uh, Lie algebra we're talking about. The other thing is that spin, when spin is two, if you have multiple particles, so if you have multiple gravitons, they cannot interact with each other. Not only that, they cannot interact with the same material. Uh, meaning if, if one graviton talks to this set of states, the other one cannot, which is interesting. So if there's a graviton, it's unique and that it's um, coupling to any other particle is, uh, has to be proportional to it, has to be equal to its um, self-coupling is called the, the equivalence principle. And I ask you to prove that also on the, the homework, but it's an extra credit. So, um, um, all right, that's it. I've gone a little bit over time and I'm sorry about that. But in the next lecture, we're gonna talk about the um, combinatorics of these on-shell diagrams and get some better feeling for how to build them up and how to describe them and talk a little bit more about that general correspondence with the Grassmannian. And we'll understand it even better in the third lecture. Thank you very much.